soils are doing us a big favor by helping us fight climate change. Today I'm going to tell you about some ongoing research here at Caltech that I'm a part of to try and better understand this process. But first I want to tell you more about how I got here. My name is Hannah Dion Kirshner. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I went to public school. Here I'm showing a picture of where I went to elementary school. And there in fifth grade was the first time I ever learned about climate change. I was really concerned and motivated to do something to help, but I couldn't really figure out how I could fit into the picture of fighting climate change. I never imagined myself becoming a scientist. What I loved the most growing up was reading, writing, and the arts, and most of all, music. I played piano, and then when I started middle school, I started playing French horn. I joined the local youth symphony orchestra and I became very serious about my music. And that was where I decided that I wanted to study music in college to try and become a classical musician. I went to Northwestern University for college in Evanston, Illinois to study French horn performance. In my first year there, I enrolled in a freshman required writing seminar. And coincidentally, the one that worked for my schedule was in environmental chemistry. We learned about the impacts of the pesticide DDT, leaded gasoline, and the aerosols that depleted the ozone layer. And that was the first time that I really understood that there were people working as scientists to try and get a better idea of how climate change works and how we can fight against it. And I became totally in love with this research area. I joined a research lab where we studied past climate on Earth. And after three years, I graduated college with a degree in earth science, and I decided I wanted to go to graduate school to continue working on research. After I finished college, I came to Caltech to do my PhD, and now I'm in my fourth year here of graduate school. For my research, I do a combination of work in the lab and work in the outdoors. And I also joined a music group here on campus so I could continue to have music as a part of my life. When people hear about my path, often they will say that it's really surprising that I went from music into earth science and that those two topics seem really unrelated. But actually, that's not how I see it at all. In fact, a lot of the skills that I learned as a musician are skills that directly help me every day in my scientific research. For example, say I want to learn a new piece of music. The first thing that I would do is do background research. I might look at the musical score and see if there are any markings that I don't recognize or places where I expect I might have a little bit of difficulty. I might look up information about the composer, um, when they were alive and what their intentions were with the music, or even listen to a recording of my favorite performer playing that piece of music. All of this background research helps me form an idea in my head about how I expect the piece of music to sound. Once I've done background research and I've formed a clear picture in my head of how I expect a piece to sound, I'll sit down and try and play it for the first time. While I'm playing, I want to make really careful observations of how everything sounds. Am I playing it too quickly or too slowly, too loudly, too softly? Are there any passages that are giving me a particular amount of difficulty? playing, maybe I noticed that I was having difficulty fitting both of my hands together. That's okay. One thing you can do while you're practicing a piece of music is make things more simple. So here I'm going to remove the variable of my left hand and play only with my right hand so I can really focus on what's going on in that part of the music. Sometimes if musicians are having trouble keeping a steady tempo or want to learn a piece faster or slower, they'll add a tool like a metronome while they practice.
If you were following along as I demonstrated how to learn a new piece of music, you might have realized that a lot of those steps are very similar to the scientific method. I started with an idea of a new piece of music that I wanted to learn. Then I did background research to form a hypothesis in my head about the sounds that I wanted to create when I was playing. Then I used a number of different experiments to see if I could reach the sounds that I was looking for. I tried changing different variables like playing with both hands or only one hand. And every time I did an experiment, I made careful observations of the results. How was it sounding? Was it getting closer to the sound that I was wanting to reach? What I want to emphasize is that I was telling you about my experience as a musician and as a scientist, but experimental thinking is actually everywhere in life. Whenever you're trying to learn a new skill, whether you're practicing your free throw or trying to perfect your favorite cake recipe, you're using the same type of experimental thinking to solve problems. Today, I use all of those skills that I gained practicing music and using experiments to better learn my music now as a researcher in the lab trying to understand Earth's climate. The climate on Earth is changing as a result of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that come from human activities. The two main greenhouse gases that are leading to Earth's warming are carbon dioxide and methane. And you can see that both of their levels in the atmosphere have been rising over the last 200 years as a result of human activity. The rising levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have been changing the climate all over the Earth. I'm showing an example from the state of California, where you can see that temperatures have risen as a result of human activity. And the most intense temperature change, almost three degrees Fahrenheit, is concentrated around the Los Angeles and Pasadena area, where Caltech is based. These changes in the climate are causing big challenges to our communities but they're also making risks for biology all over the planet, all kinds of organisms. For example, organisms like the polar bear that rely on Arctic sea ice are losing their habitat. Coral reefs in the ocean and the communities that live around them are at risk due to increasing acidity and temperature of the ocean. And here in California, the Joshua tree is losing its habitat because of rising summer temperatures and increasing wildfire risk. I think a lot of us talk a lot about how climate change is affecting biology. But as earth scientists, we also like to think about the opposite direction, how biology is affecting climate change. To give you an example, let's go back in time. About 500 million years ago on Earth, there were the very first animals evolving in the ocean. But for the first time, plants evolved on land. These land plants were tiny, and if you saw them today, you might not even recognize them as plants, but they drastically changed the surface of the earth. The plants changed the chemical composition of mud, and they stabilized the land, changing the way that rivers flowed across the planet's surface. They also interacted with the ground beneath them. They took some chemical ingredients out of the ground and put some new ones into it, creating the first soils. Shortly after plants first evolved on land, ice caps formed at the north and south poles of the planet. And some scientists think that even these ice caps are the result of the first plants evolving on the planet because they changed the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I showed you an example from Earth's history, but biology is still affecting climate change today. We talked about how human activity is increasing carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere from things like fossil fuel production and landfills. But organisms on Earth's surface, like plants and plankton and seagrass in the ocean, are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And beneficial bacteria living in Earth's soils are actually removing methane from the air. These beneficial bacteria are the subject of my research. Let's talk a little bit more about what methane is. Methane is a gas that's odorless and colorless. It may be one of the cooking gases that you use in your stove at home. Methane is released into the atmosphere as a result of the fossil fuel industry, but there are other sources of methane to the atmosphere too, including from cows, like the cows that humans use for agriculture. I wanna introduce you to my favorite microorganisms, the methanotrophs. Their name literally means methane eaters. These microbes live in the soil and they eat methane for food, just like you might've eaten cereal this morning. From the methane, they're able to get biomass and energy so that they can grow. Methanotrophs live in almost every soil on Earth. 
whether in a dry environment, a wet environment, or even a soil like on farmland that's used by humans. To give you a better idea of the effect of methanotrophs on our environment, I'm showing a graph that compares the amount of methane that's consumed by methanotrophs in the soils versus the amount of methane that's released into the atmosphere by humans every year. The amount of methane consumed by methanotrophs is about 10% of the total amount released by humans every year. So methanotrophs are not going to undo the harmful effects of human emissions, but they are doing us a really big favor. For my research, we are interested in understanding how methanotrophs in California are responding to different environments. We want to test their sensitivity to things like temperature, precipitation, and human land use like agriculture. To do that, we're making measurements of methanotrophy methane consumption rates in very different California environments. We have field locations that are on California's coast and all the way inland in the Mojave Desert, where it's extremely dry and hot, especially in the summers. In order to measure methanotrophy at these different field sites, we need to make observations of a process that's very small and very slow. So even though methanotrophy is a really important contributor to the overall picture of greenhouse gases on Earth. The microbes are too small for us to see with our eyes, and the amount of methane that, the, that any given patch of soil is consuming at any one moment is very small compared to the total amount of methane in the air around you. To think about how we need to design an experiment to measure this process, you can imagine trying to observe the effect of food coloring on pool water. If you were trying to measure with your eyes, how much food coloring could change the color of pool water, and you only had one bottle of food coloring, it would be very difficult to see any change if you dropped the food coloring into the pool. But if you could trap a small amount of that pool water into a glass, then you would be able to see a change by dropping the food coloring into the water. The idea for our experiment to measure methanotrophy at these different California field locations is very similar. Scientists have developed a method to trap a small pocket of the atmosphere in contact with the soil surface. And so in this small pocket of atmosphere, you can actually observe the amount of methane that's changing using a methane analyzer instrument that's connected to the small pocket. The method that scientists have developed to make this measurement is called a flux chamber. When we started working on this project here at Caltech, we had to develop our own flux chamber. And just like when I'm practicing a piece of music, it took a few tries for us to get it right. When we were very first testing the instrument, we made a flux chamber out of a cardboard box. But we quickly realized that this was far too leaky for us to measure the signal that we were interested in observing. Then we used a leak-proof plastic container as our flux chamber but it became too humid inside that container because the water in the soil was evaporating. So we added a water trap onto our system. But still, inside that plastic container, it was becoming too hot inside the sunlight. And so finally, after several rounds of experimentation, careful observations, and trying new things, we were able to create a flux chamber to make an accurate measurement of the rate of soils taking up methane from the atmosphere. What we've learned from our research with this flux chamber is that California soils are consuming methane even in very extreme environments like the Mojave Desert. For example, based on our results, we estimate that one football field of desert land in the Mojave Desert could consume about 450 gallons of methane each year. That would be enough pure methane to fill 10 bathtubs. Our research is focusing on measuring methanotrophy in the environment in California to better understand how this process works in the natural world and how it's responding to changes in the environment right now. There are researchers all around the world that are making similar measurements in different environments. But this research is just a small part of the bigger picture, trying to understand the future of methanotrophy and atmospheric methane. There are scientists that are studying methanotrophy in order to increase carbon sequestration in the soil. There are scientists that are working on engineering microbes so that they can eat even more methane. And there are scientists that are using methanotrophy measurements in order to predict future methane levels in the atmosphere. The main takeaway from our work is that California soils are really doing us a big favor, removing methane from the atmosphere and helping us fight climate change. This confirms what we already knew, which is that soils are performing a really essential ecosystem service that is helping us. And so we should help soils back. 
there are lots of ways that we can protect our soils. For example, we can prevent erosion and avoid new development like pavement over soils. Humans need construction, they need new buildings and places to live, but there are ways that humans and soils can flourish at the same time. For example, a green roof lets humans and methanotrophs live in the same environment. The main ideas that I hope you take away today are first, that experiments are everywhere in life. Whether you are learning a new skill in sports, cooking, writing, or anything else that you're interested in, you're using the same experimental mindset that scientists use to find out new things about the world. The second thing that I hope I've convinced you today is that the relationship between climate and biology is a two-way street. We've learned today that there are organisms on Earth that are affecting climate change, like the first plants that evolved on our planet, and like the microbes that live in our soils and are taking methane out of the air. There are also things that we as humans can do to fight climate change to keep our communities safe and healthy.